I'm John Montgomery. Welcome to Chess Dog. Today we're going to answer the question, who is the youngest person who ever defeat a grandmaster in chess? Well, I'll tell you, he was eight years old when he defeated a grandmaster. His name is David Howell. And it was a blitz game, but let me say this, his opponent, the Grandmaster opponent, was none other than John Nunn, who at his peak was ranked ninth in the world, what today we would call a super Grandmaster. Young David Howell, eight years old at the time, would also mature into an amazing player, a Grandmaster with a rating of over 2,700. He's still the youngest uh, player from Great Britain to become a grandmaster at the age of 16. Let's go over their game to see how an eight-year-old beat a legend of the game. And the young man had the black pieces. So John Nunn begins with e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6. We get a main line Spanish, bishop b5, a6, bishop a4, knight f6. John Nunn plays d3, a little bit slower, avoids some of the critical theory, becomes more of a maneuvering game, perhaps where he can outmaneuver his less experienced opponent. b5, bishop b3, bishop e7, castles, castles, knight b to d2, white begins that standard maneuver where the rook goes to e1, the knight goes to f1, and then to g3, or, or e3, goes to g3 in this game. Black plays d6, threatening knight to a5, now that the e5 pawn is protected. Black would love to trade off his knight for that light squared bishop, so... John Nunn plays c3 to tuck that bishop away at c2. The knight does go to a5. Now, the knight goes to the side of the board. We don't like to have our knights on the side of the board, usually, but it gains a tempo by threatening to exchange itself off for the bishop, and it also clears the way for the c-pawn to come to c5, so black can gain space. The bishop does go to c2. c5 is played. Rook e1, clearing away the way again for that knight maneuver, knight f1, knight g3, and also adding further support to the e-pawn so that white could eventually play d4, which he would like to do, gain space in the center. Rook to e8. Now black has a standard maneuver of his own. The rook goes to e8, the bishop goes to f8, g6 is played, and then the bishop is fine kettled sort of slowly and artificially on the king's side, and that allows his king to be safer and for him to control the center. Knight to f1, bishop f8, knight g3. The g6 pawn also controls f5, so the knight can't jump into those squares. Bishop to g5. h3 is probably the preferred move here, but bishop g5 is perfectly playable. Bishop to g7. Queen to d2. Defending, Connecting with that bishop on g5, maybe he'll play bishop h6, threaten to exchange off that dark squared bishop, but probably not. He really wants to centralize his pieces and advance in the center. David, the eight-year-old, plays bishop to b7, puts some pressure on e4, and also prepares perhaps an advance of the d-pawn to d5. White plays h4, wants to play h5 and exchange a pawn and weaken black's king. Black responds with h5. This is a novelty of the game, the first new move. White plays rook a to d1 and centralizes. White's got his pieces where he wants, and now he wants to push through in the center. Black puts his knight back on c6, places it in the center. a3, white controls the b4 square. If the c pawn were to get exchanged in the center, the knight can't come to b4. White might even play b4 himself. The rook goes to c8. You can see that Black is setting it up so he might actually play that c5 pawn to c4 and gain space on the queen side in that way. The bishop goes back to b1. The bishop is blocked by white's own d3 and e4 pawns, so if the bishop goes to a2, it's a much more active diagonal for him. Knight goes to a5. Now he wants to play c4 to gain that space on the queen side. Bishop a2, c4. So he's gained space on the queen side. And he's hitting that d3 square that could become a weakness later in the game, a target for black. White passes by, goes ahead and plays d4. The problem is that bishop on a2 doesn't have much of a future now. Um, it's, it's blocked, and, uh, but, and there's a weakness on the d3 square. At the moment, it doesn't look like white can do much about that. But we'll see what happens with that square as the game progresses. E D4, C D4. Now White has a central pawn majority with the E4 and D4 pawns, but Black has a queen side pawn majority. See A6, B5, and C4. 
So the battle lines are being drawn. Black plays queen to b6, and what that does is it removes the pin from the knight at f6, so now the e4 pawn is being attacked by the bishop at b7, the rook at e8, and the knight at f6. It's attacked three times, it's only defended twice. So uh, the grandmaster, John Nunn, has to do something about it, and he decides to play d5. This is a very committal move. It gains space in the center, adds to the control of the c6 square, makes it hard for Black's knight to get activated, and it blunts that b7 bishop. So it does a lot of good things. But it also gives up some key squares. It gives up the c5 square and the e5 square. So it's a, it's a trade-off. It's a judgment call, and it's a trade-off. White plays knight to g Black, excuse me, plays knight to g4. And you can see already that this eight-year-old is playing unbelievably sophisticated chess. This is this is strategic chess, and he's making really smart moves. I can only imagine John Nunn during this game thinking, oh my goodness, this kid is really a talented, talented player. Now the Grandmaster plays the knight to d4. The knight's very strong on this square. It radiates a lot of power, uh, and it blocks the dark squared bishop for the time being. Black plays knight to e5. Aha! The d3 square is weak. The knight on e5 is aiming right for that d3 square where it would love to land. Bishop to b1, to challenge that knight, if it were to land on that square, white would capture it. Now, if you look carefully, you will see that Black's, black has two poorly placed minor pieces. The knight on a5 is on the side of the board. The bishop at b7 is biting on granite with that d5 pawn. But look as it has the game progresses, how the young player is able to deal with these poorly placed pieces. It's an incredible level of chess sophistication at such a young age. Really unfathomable, to be honest. First he plays knight to b3. So that trades off, that beautifully centralized knight for white is now traded off for black's lousy knight on a5. Really a, 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 a real coup for the eight-year-old, although it does compromise his pawn majority a bit, but it's definitely worth it. Bishop comes to e3, hitting black's queen. The queen retreats to d8. Bishop goes to g5. Queen goes back to b6. And the eight-year-old might be saying, hey, let's do a repetition. I'd love to get a draw against a grandmaster. But uh, the uh, super GM John Nunn says, not quite yet. I want to keep playing and plays queen to e3. So he goes into an endgame. Queen e3, rook e3. And it's important to remember that Grandmaster John Nunn is an incredible endgame player and has written a number of very important books on the endgame. So now we're going into a part of the game that he is really, really good at. Oh, by the way, if you're getting value from this video, be sure to click the like button. It would be greatly appreciated. But now this, the eight-year-old plays phenomenal chess from this point forward. He plays knight to c4, aiming at the b2 pawn. So the bishop at g7 and the knight at c4 attack b2. The rook takes the b3 pawn, knight takes b2. So now the 3 versus 2 majority has been replaced by a 2 to 1 majority, and black only has one really bad piece, and that's the bishop at b7. Every other piece is well placed. The rook goes to c1, rooks are exchanged, the knight goes back to c4, bishop to d3. Now, important moment. This is a bad move. Bishop to d3. Uh, but it's understandable. I mean, the strategic goal, right, is to trade off that well-placed knight on c4 with his bad bishop. Uh, do you see why this is a bad move? I'll give you a second. That's right. And the eight-year-old saw this in a blitz game. Truly phenomenal. Bishop takes d5. Now that terrible bishop has won a pawn, and black is now winning. Why does this work? Because when John Nunn took the bishop, rook to e1 check, a double attack. The king at g1 and the bishop at c1 are attacked, so black gets his piece back and the pawn. King h2, rook to c1, knight e4, targeting the pawn on d6. The knight goes to e5. Now, white played bishop to e2. You might be wondering, why doesn't white just go ahead and take that pawn on d6. That seems reasonable. Well, here's why. Black would take the knight on the bishop on d3, rook takes d3, then bishop e5 check, and you have a double attack, and the knight is lost. So white plays bishop to e2, the knight goes to d7, 
the, the pawn still cannot be taken for the same reason. Bishop e5 check. G3 is played to block that very threat, and uh, now the pawn is threatened. Bishop goes to e5 to protect the pawn. White goes king to g2. Why doesn't he just play f4? Now the bishop gets kicked away. Well, because after rook to c2, the bishop is pinned, and after rook e3, maybe bishop d4, the rook is kicked away, and black is completely winning. So king to g2 is played, which takes away this threat. Now f4 is threatened, and black goes to c5. Is that knight at e4 is causing all kinds of irritation, threatening the pawn at d6. Black wants to trade it off. Get it off the board. Knight c5, rook c5. Okay. So the GM is hoping that an opposite colored bishop endgame will be his saving grace. Now, there are still a pair of rooks on the board, uh, but we'll have to see how does this eight year old's endgame technique hold up against a legendary grandmaster endgame player. Rook d3, rook to c3. He goes right into the end game, he, the opposite color bishop's end game. He takes the rooks right off the board. King f3, rook d3, bishop d3, f5. You notice how black has set up a pawn barrier. The pawns are on light squares, while his bishop controls the dark squares. That way he controls both color complexes, the white and the dark squares. King e2, king f7, the king marches forward. King f3, king e7. They maneuver for a couple of moves, king f3, now bishop b2, going after the weak pawn on a3. The pawn advances, pawn takes, bishop takes a6, king to f6. Now black has this passed pawn on a4, and that's big trouble for white. Now the king wants to advance to e5 to put pressure on that, e5, that d5 pawn. King to e2, king to e5, bishop c4 defending the pawn. King to d4, the king marches with tempo because he hits the bishop. Bishop to a2, king to c3. Now you see what the king is doing. The king is marching to the queen side to help escort his own a pawn to the queening square, and forcing white to give up his bishop in exchange for that pawn. King to d1, bishop a3 allows the king to go into b2. The c1 square is controlled by the bishop, so white's king can't block him out. King to e2, bishop c1. King to d1, king to b2, hitting the bishop, bishop to c4, now bishop to h6, controlling that key diagonal, and now the pawn is going to march, and there is nothing John Nunn, the grandmaster, can do to stop it. King e2, a3, king d3, a2, bishop a2, king to a2, king to c4, bishop to d2, and that's it. I mean, the piece is gone. The Grandmaster plays on for a couple of more moves, but uh, it's pointless and uh, it's sort of just inertia keeping him playing. Let's look at the last couple of moves. King to b5, bishop e1, king c6, bishop f2, king b6, bishop g3, king, king e6, bishop h4, d6 and f4. And the bishop on h4 guarantees that that pawn will be captured when it queens, and the f-pawn cannot be stopped. And John Nunn resigned. An eight-year-old David Howell won a game, the youngest player in history at the age of eight, to defeat a grand master. Thank you for joining us at Chess Dog.